Good evening, everyone. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Anna Fetter. I'm the Director of Programming in the Visual and Media Arts Department at Emerson College. Uh, and I have the honor of programming what is now temporarily this virtual space that we're calling Bright Lights at Home. Bright Lights runs every Tuesday and Thursday during the semester in the Bright Family Screening Room in the Paramount Center in downtown Boston. Uh, while the space is dark, we're trying to find new ways to connect, and that's how this program was born. I've chosen eight films available on Netflix or Hulu for you all to watch ahead of time and then join us for these moderated discussions. You can find the full lineup on our website at emerson.edu slash bright lights. You should also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter for the latest updates. Uh, I also encourage you to join our mailing list through our website if you've not done so already. Uh, we'll be sending an, out an email with the Zoom link on the day of the event by 2 p.m. and then again at 5 p.m. Uh, we'll also be recording these talks to share at a later date. Uh, and we're also streaming live to our Facebook page. So hello to the folks who are joining us on Facebook Live. So now I'd like to welcome our speakers. Uh, Petra Costa is a Brazilian actress and filmmaker and has been a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences since 2018. She studied at the Dramatic Arts School at the University of Sao Paulo, completed her undergraduate studies in anthropology at Barnard, Barnard College, Columbia University, and completed her master's in social psychology at the London School of Economics, focusing her studies on the concept of trauma. She is known for her documentaries that often mix fix fiction with nonfiction and political with personal. Her latest film, the Academy Award nominated documentary, The Edge of Democracy, which just came out last year, uh, premiering at Sundance Film Festival, is a Netflix original documentary um, and premiered uh, at the opening night of the Sundance Film Festival in 2019. Um, we're also followed by Dr. Katerina gonzalez Seligman. Uh, who researches Latin American and Caribbean literature and history. Her work focuses on intertextual literary forms, including literary magazines, translations, translation, influence, textual evolution, and adaptations. Her research interests also include anti-racist rhetoric and aesthetics, the relationship between literary infrastructure and cultural capital, decolonizing literary theory, and intersectional research methods. She acquired her Bachelor of Arts degree at Columbia University, as well as a master's and PhD at Brown University. At Emerson College, she teaches courses in Latin American, Caribbean, and US Latinx literatures. In 2017, she was awarded the Helene and Stanley Miller Award for Outstanding Teaching. So welcome to you both. Hello, thank you so much for having us. And Petra, thank you so much for joining us. Thank Did you. <laughs> thank ahead. you, Anna. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you, Bia. Everyone who is watching. <laughs> Oh, and I, I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce uh, Bea Bausis, who uh, works in the cinema as well and is from Brazil and, and uh, is going to be involved in the conversation as well. So one thing that's worth mentioning as we have this conversation, because it's a fun fact, that you might have noticed that Petra and I went to college in basically the same place. We also did that at the same time and have known each other since then, which means that I have gotten to be a fan of Petra's films since we were in college. I believe I was interviewed for a documentary film that you made as part of your undergraduate thesis on gentrification. Um, and I've been a fan and following your work um, since then. And I'm interested in hearing from you. I mean, your films, these, um, you know, your last film was the most watched documentary in Brazil. It had a huge impact. Um, this film has been nominated for an Academy Award. Um, it's an extraordinary film. It's in addition to being uh, aesthetically a model, it's also an education in Brazilian political history and the Brazilian political present. And I'd, be, I'd really love to hear from you uh, what you, how you understand the impact of your film. Well, I'm a big admirer of you, Katarina source of inspiration with your bright mind over the years, which I miss so much. I'm happy we can have this conversation. <laughs> um, so the film uh, about the impact of the film, well, a film that is dealing with something that has been the main issue in everyone's discussion in Brazil for three years, uh, it was the country was taken into traumatic and traumatic event. Uh, as Lenin says, there's um, there's decades where nothing happens, and then there's weeks when decades happen. And I think the last 
like for the three years that the film talks about, but unfortunately for the past five years in Brazil, it's been like that. Every week feels like a decade. And we were all having a very hard time digesting what was happening and making sense of it. It was like the country we knew disappeared every week it would disappear and then and, and and the country is still in such an earthquake that it's hard to know what is brazil anymore any reference of what we had of what brazil was growing up dissolved and so the film have talking about all that was necessarily going to be in the conversation and having as main characters dilma and lula and bolsonaro uh made it be kind of explosive when it came out in Brazil. And it was very intense to see it being tweeted one, there was like one tweet per minute for months in Brazil about the film. And it was in a lot of conversation in the end of the year, Netflix published that it was the second most watched documentary in Netflix in Brazil, which was really great to be able to have that impact. And then of course, with the nomination, the impact even ex exploded even more. And, but before that, like what I would, the message I would get in, in, in social media that really inspired me was from people who said that they were not speaking to their best friend for the past years and that in seeing the film, they could, they finally spoke again because they could find empathy for each other's different point of view. And I got that message many times from people that said that they were like reconnecting with their parents, with their mothers, because finally the film opened a perspective that they were closed off because we're living in these polarized societies and Brazil has become more and more similar to the United States. Um, with this polarization where we have this abyss between the two sides and for some the film was able to create a bridge in that abyss um, and the other was people who re-evaluated their perspective saying oh my god i was so brainwashed uh, and i i hit my pan and protested against dilma or went to the protest and now seeing the film i realized how uh mistaken i was or not but some many many wrote that and and kind of and or voted for this man that i now realize how that was uh equivocal equivocated position but so these just creating these types of reflections was really what i wanted because what was very unfortunate is that there was the media in brazil was uh, is very monopolized by very few families and these they supported the military coup in 64 uh, most of them and supported the impeachment now supported lula's imprisonment and gave a very similar perspective of what was happening at each time uh, and it was hard it was like living living in a fiction show where like the only perspective that you could read in the magazine see on television was the fact that Dilma had to be impeached no matter what. She was a very bad president in many aspects and made many mistakes, but they were not impeachable and none of the media reflected on that. So it was until the foreign media started to come, which they did during the vote of April 17th, the, there was just one version of the facts um, that we could have access to. And that's also what sparked my desire to make the film because it was, I was living in an alternate narrative that didn't converge with what I was seeing with my own eyes. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, I mean, so I sort of have a related question. Um, the second to last question that you pose in the film, and I'll read the translation, is how do we deal with a future that looks as bleak as our darkest past. And, um, you know, as I think about that question right now and look around the world right now as the future, right, of um, you posing that question at the end of this film, I, I wonder if you might, 
I can't ask you how to answer your own question. Um, how do we deal with this future that is so bleak? But I'm wondering um, if you could sort of talk a little bit about what has happened since the film. Um, you know, Lula's been released. Um, there's a pandemic. Bolsonaro has denied um, its sort of severity and reality in the same way that Trump did and others. And um, you know, I sort of how do you see the is 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 Brazil still on the edge of democracy or is it somewhere else entirely? It, yeah, it's it's hard to know these days how big is the edge. You know, like it, it feels we're getting each day closer to the the precipice of that edge. Um, and with Bolsonaro having threatened a coup many times, um, even now, like today, um, he. He's constantly giving threats of a possible coup, and so are some of his government too. So, so we're constantly living in the fear of what of a coup happening and what will happen when it does. He, the pandemic, his attitudes towards the pandemic have been the worst possible. I think the worst of any leader in the world. Um, he copied Trump, but he's been much more adamant in his own ignorance than Trump has I mean, he, and, and been attending protests, incentivizing the people not to stop working, saying it's a little flu and that an athlete like him would never uh, get uh, threatened by and not having any sense of leadership. Um, and what has been interesting is to see the, the support that he's been losing with that. Um, of other right-wing governors, Congress people, and and right-wing leaders that are abandoning him and leaving him more and more isolated. But what is also surprising is the amount of people that continue to follow him, <laughs> despite his uh, crazy remarks. And that's due to kind of this parallel reality that social media has been so effective in creating in him and he and Trump so masterful in leading. Thank you so much for talking about that. I'm sure that what you just said will elicit, elicit other questions from the broader, broader, the broader audience. I thought I'd ask one more question of um, that is sort of more of a filmmaking question before we open up to um, questions from the audience. So, um, I, you know, we've, we've talked before um, about the legacy of 1960s Latin American cinema in your kind of education as a filmmaker and also in sort of shaping your style. And one of the elements um, that is sort of so strong in your work and that is really um, sort of effective in uh, the edge of democracy is the way that you use the voiceover. So I can't help but think about the um, famous and very important Cuban filmmaker, Tomas Gutierrez Alea's use of the voiceover, especially in his most famous film, Memorias del Subdesarrollo, Memories of Underdevelopment, um, that I know you know well. And the way that you use the voiceover sort of both creates the kind of sense of order in the narrative structure of the film, but often also creates a tension, right, between what is seen and what isn't seen. And um, that strikes me as really important for someone like Bolsonaro and um, related contemporary political figures who seem to be doing sort of one thing um, on screen, right, and also leading to effects that are invisible. Um, so I wonder about kind of how you think about your use of the voiceover as a filmmaker and in this particular film. Yeah, there's this, uh, I, I love essay films. I love uh, Chris Marker and Yves Varda's work and, and of other uh, filmmakers that use the, the film form to create essay films and, and the essay format in literature too and how it incites us to reflect 
and kind of expand our subjectivity. And it's interesting because Edmundo, uh, there's noise, the writer of uh, Memories of Underdevelopment, says that there's a, a tendency in Latin America to adore Quixote and the sound and the fury and to be very much about Latin American cinema. Yeah? And, and I think in literature too. Um, and be very much about these impossible desires and their conquest and, and very little subjectivity. And so more like Don Quixote and less like Hamlet. And, and I think I've been more attracted um, to, to the Hamlet, the Hamletian kind of uh, way. And, and I, I, I think it, it's lacking. It's lacking in our societies in general, right? Self-reflection and reflection about things. I think cinema, films, series have become so much about actions and, and, um, and hooks and turning points and very little reflection, very little time to zoom out and, and think. And that's what I wanted to do with this film. And, and I, it was beautiful how the landscape of Brasilia lended itself so well to, to do that because it's the perfect uh, scenery uh, to be able to zoom out of and see the political space uh, designed there. Uh, the worst for a capital to actually function, <laughs> but the best for a dystopic film. Um, and, and so that, that's what I, the way I, I started to envision the film as these spaces, the presidential palace and the architectural spaces of Brasilia as spaces where we could zoom out of the tragedy of the here and now and reflect uh, more with more distance about this country and democracy and what are these patterns that we're repeating again and again and again um, in Brazil, kind of this traumatic recurrence of coups that were doomed and still stuck in. So um, I think we're ready to open up to questions, um, but I, first I wanted to, um, to encourage Bia to share her own story. So Bia is an Emerson student, works in the cinema, and is also from Brazil and has a, a connection to the film. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Bia. Um, I, well, I was telling Anna uh, earlier today, and Petra even like touched on, on the whole um, uh, on this point that like um, I I was one of the, like the brainwashed ones uh, so like I grew up in a somewhat conservative household and uh, my whole life my family like my my parents and uh, some of my aunts and uncles would be like oh that's terrible that like all the time that you've been alive I, I, I'm 22 so most of the time that you've been alive you um, Brazil was under um, PT, the, the Workers Party, and, and for the longest time, like, yes, like, uh, when in 2012, 2013, people were going to the streets for the impeachment, and my parents were like, yeah, and I was like, yeah, let's go, and only later that I uh, would, like, decide to polit politicize myself and read more about it, and I was like, oh, that that was a coup, that, that, was, that was not supposed to happen. <laughs> um, so and then again like i and for the longest time it's been like the most like uh it's what i've, I've been discussing the most with like my parents and then um again with like friends that i meet uh at emerson uh or like people that are not from brazil and have no idea what's going on and they just they're just kind of like oh yeah yeah like bolsonaro he's kind of like the trump of brazil right um and so it was really great to have um, Edge of Democracy to like, kind of like just show it to them so that I don't have to explain, I don't know, Brazil since the like 1950s to them. Um, and yeah, so that's my, my relationship with the movie. And, um, and yeah, it, it's an incredible movie. And yeah. Thank you. 
So uh, Bea, do you want to read uh, the question from Claudia? Because it looks like it's um, both in English and in Portuguese. Yeah, yeah um, so Claudia uh, said, in having the projects be so current, political and controversial, how was the process to attract investors and potential financiers from for the film's production and how did Netflix get involved? And then in Portuguese she said, and also thank you so much for your dedication to the project, which uh, exposed the um, very tense climate of Brazil uh, and the presence of uh, women filmmakers to the rest of the world. Um, so yeah. Thank you, Bia, for your moving uh, speech. <laughs> Very happy that the film was able to dialogue with, with your experience. Um, about Claudia's question, the, the film, yes, was extremely controversial since uh, the beginning. And one thing that we had very clear for this film is that we didn't want money from the Brazilian government or any Brazilian company. So we started fundraising through international organizations and at first uh, were funded by Ford, Tribeca, um, uh, um, a, a couple of uh, Sundance Institute, many US foundations and, and a few British as well. And, and then we did a teaser and a few edits of scenes and um, showed it to Netflix and they were very interested and we started a conversation and they soon acquired the film to be a Netflix original during production. And that's what allowed us for, to continue filming through for three years and um, making such a kind of Herculean um, production where we were like filming in, in small simultaneous places while things were happening. And yeah, but, and thank you for your words. <laughs> so there's another question here and then we'll go to some from Facebook Live. Uh, Sarah Fika asks, how did you gain such incredible access to the people that you filmed? So the access was very hard and the film, it seemed very easy when I went by and filmed Domo, but actually, it took me ages. I, in, in, the, uh, in the beginning of the process, I wrote a letter to Dilma and to Lula, like saying how I wanted to film them and I was making this film. Of course, they never read those letters. And then I w went, we went to, with our team to the, uh, which was Karin Ronic, who was our assistant director, Jean Atala, who was our amazing DP, and Alice Lanari, who was our producer in, in Brazil, to, the con to Congress and started to try to get access to normal congressmen. And every congressman we would meet, we would ask them for help to get to access to Dilma and Lula. They would say it's impossible. Uh, I started to, to manage to speak to Doma's assistant and he would say, oh, tomorrow, 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 and tomorrow never came and we were starting to give up uh, until I managed to sneak in a bus full of historians and, that were going to visit Doma in the presidential palace. And, and there I managed to get into the presidential palace for the first time. And, and spoke to Dilma and handed her a DVD of my first film, Elena, and told her that I'd been in months in Brasilia, that I just wanted to interview her. And then she said, okay, I'll give you an interview next week. I think it still took a month, but eventually she gave us an interview. And that interview was super formal and rigid and didn't even make it to the film. But from there, I was like, please, can I accompany you in something? And the moment that I'm there in the car with her, the impeachment for you to have an idea had already passed. It was, she, we had already filmed the impeachment for six months. She was ousted and she was living in Porto Alegre, uh, in the south of Brazil. And so she had a lot of time and finally let us in. <laughs> There's someone who raised their hand. Hi everyone. Hi Bia. I hope that you're doing well. Um, so uh, I actually saw um, your first documentary, Elena, uh, first, and then I saw The Edge of Democracy after. And I was just wondering um, if you could speak how to like, how making Elena influenced 
you in making the edge of democracy because they're very different in a lot of ways, but they still have a lot of poetic elements to it. So Elena's very like personal and it's very private. Um, and then the edge of democracy is definitely personal, but it's definitely more public. Um, so I was just wondering how your first documentary influenced um, you making the edge of democracy. I think both are about trauma and Elena is about a very particular personal trauma, uh, that of losing a sister, of dealing with death, and and the sensation of a double and and reliving one the same fate as another person and and not having control over one's own life, um, and trying to find your own body. <laughs> While the edge of democracy is about a very different type of trauma, social trauma uh, that I think many of us went through in 2016, where we had spent many years believing that democracy was a given and a kind of a, sorry, my dad, and a kind of right, a birthright. Uh, I had that idea that it was a right acquired from a lifetime of of my parents' struggle and, and, and their generation struggle and to have that taken away, like to have the, the ground on which I stood uh, and, and, and many of us thought we stood on completely dissolve and, and not have any guarantees of, of a democratic stability and, and, and that the fact of who you vote for president actually matters. And, and so what, what type of guarantees do we have and and all all the questions and then the rise of fascism and how do we deal with that and and the return of very fundamentalist opinions uh, that are that hurt in our own bodies that we or in the bodies of anyone who has who is not <laughs> um, a white old man or has any type of empathy for others. Um, and yeah, so I think that's, that's how Elena influenced this one uh, in the sense of, 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 of investigating a trauma. Bia, do you wanna read the next question that we have here in Zoom? Yeah, uh, so this question is coming from Pedro Almeida. Uh, he says, how do you evaluate the impact of later political documentaries, such as the ones made by Eduardo Coutinho and Patricio Guzman in Latin America politics? And what did you expect while making um, The Edge of Democracy uh, in terms of the political scenery? Well, I love the work of Eduardo Coutinho and I recommend everyone watch. I think there are some of his films on YouTube um, and I think he has influenced so many documentary filmmakers in, in Brazil and Latin America in the way he geniusly uh, interviews people and asks questions and empathizes and manages to take what, that which is the most interest, human and philosophically, like philosophical investigations out of anyone uh, that he manages to, to interview and interact with. Um, and Patricio Guzman, The Battle of Chile was a huge inspiration for me. Um, I also recommend it's on all the episodes on, on YouTube. And that, it, what, I would not have made this film if I had not seen The Battle of Chile. Uh, it was in seeing The Battle of Chile that I understood what was happening in Brazil. It felt like we were repeating the same things that had happened in Chile in the 70s. Um, and all the steps of, of a coup were, were very well designed and portrayed there um, and then repeated here. And there, there was a lot of US influence. And here, I think we will, in later years, have a revelation of how much U.S. influence there was and everything that happened here too. Um, Petra, I wanted to ask you a question um, about filming that those very evocative scenes in the presidential palace. And I thought 
it would be lovely to hear from you what it was like to film there um, and kind of what was the process into, I mean, there are good political reasons for rendering the palace as sort of ominously as you did, but it's not a, a necessary move. It was definitely a kind of really interesting and evocative move to render it so ominously. So if you could talk a little bit about that process. Since I entered that palace for the first time, I was quite enthralled by it and wanted to be able to, fin it, to film it with, with a steady cam. Um, because there was so much of contained in that space and and also the the emptiness of power and because that's precisely i was there in the moment of emptiness of power where Dilma had been ousted Temer had not moved into the presidential palace and and it took a long time to be able to have the access to to be able to film it the way i wanted and it was interesting that it happened uh, right at that moment where there was this absence of power and the day we managed to film, they were coincidentally taking out Dilma's um, belongings from the palace. So while we were doing the study camp, her, her clothes started to be taken away, her mattress. And it was the best image of her expulsion from that place that we could ever have dreamt of and and it's a palace that well it, it exposes so much of the contradiction of brasilia uh, which was planned to be the perfect city to house democracy but is isolated brazilian democracy from the people a palace that was built by a communist that needs 120 workers to be able to maintain it. It's so contradictory. <laughs> and now with the coronavirus, you have a president that doesn't want to dismiss the, those workers while he has the virus. Um, I, 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 all, I constantly dream of the idea of Brasilia all becoming a thematic park or a museum because I feel the whole city is incompatible with the functional democracy. That palace, definitely so. Thank you for that. I had a feeling that you were going to tell an interesting story about what, <laughs> what that was like ever since I, I watched it. Um, so, I mean, another question that really, that pertains to the film and is in some ways a follow-up uh, to a question that someone asked about there's sort of continuity between the very personal last film that you made before the edge of democracy and Lena um, and and then the way that this film is also a personal film I mean the sort of really important part of the film when you talk about the um, history of your family and the kind of divided political history of your family and it's a very specific choice for a filmmaker especially a documentary filmmaker to insert themselves in a film and uh, when it's made, it's usually made with very specific ethical, political orientation. And so I thought I would ask you sort of what that specific ethical, political stance means for you to sort of put yourself in the film the way that you did. At Barnard, when I was studying anthropology, I was always fascinated by and very troubled by the discussions of how, of how complicated it is to portray the other and the issues of power and colonialism and that are imbued in, in, the, in that portrayal. And, and I feel that for me, I mean, not in everything I will do, but in these projects and Elena and, and it had to be, but in this one, particularly, it was a choice to, to put uh, my personal voiceover and to, to reflect on my own family because it, 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 because of many reasons. One of them, to be transparent of where I was coming from. Another one, because I, I was precisely interested not just on the events, but 
on the relationship between an individual and his or her own democracy and the pain and the, of, of losing that democracy. And that can only be embodied if, if I describe what is my relationship to democracy and my relationship to democracy is constructed from my parents' relationship to democracy, my grandparents' relationship to democracy, like how my ancestors uh, regarded or disregarded democracy. And, and then also because I, I feel that they were very helpful in showing the history of Brazil and its contradictions. The fact that my grandparents uh, supported the military coup and, and were happy that it happened because they were afraid they would lose their land uh, if the president at the time, Jango, continued in power. And while my parents decided to break off from the family and fought uh, for years against the military dictatorship, first dreaming of a revolution and then trying to, to, to do change through democracy. Um, and, and how I, in the middle of that, tried to make sense of, of both these sides, which were for many years dormant. This polarization was dormant and, and the fact that Lula left office with 87% approval rate but then was completely reignited and, and so well expressed in that wall that's constructed in Brasilia uh, before the vote for the impeachment, which happened tomorrow, 17th of April. <laughs> um, Bia, do you want to, um, Leonardo had, had uh, their hand up, and so I don't know if you want to read your question or if you want us to read it. Okay, because it's now in the chat window. So Bia, do you want to read that question? Yeah. Um, hi, Leo. Um, so he asked, since Bolsonaro has been elected, it feels like enough has happened to make two or three more documentaries. Are there any plans for a sequel to The Edge of Democracy? And also he's heard rumors of you working on a new project re regarding COVID-19. And since the outbreak is now, is now a very political theme in Brazil, would you, would that tackle the actions or lack thereof of the Bolsonaro government? Yeah, I, yeah, there is a lot of material for new films <laughs> and it's hard to keep track of the in, vertigo. Um, about Corona, COVID-19, what we are doing is a project called Dystopia and I would like to invite any of you who would like to collaborate what we're doing is we have a platform where we're inviting people to uh, film their own narratives, their own experiences of the pandemia and of, of the quarantine um, in their houses, in their communities, in their neighborhoods. And of course, keeping at safe and at home uh, the most necessary, but it, only filming when you outside, when you absolutely have to go out. Um, and we will make, the idea is to make a mosaic of these different narratives uh, in these dystopic times of the pandemic. So how do, how do folks let you know if they're interested in participating? Well, we have, uh, we will be posting tomorrow in English uh, a call to action uh, in our social media pages. So if you can tune in to um, my page on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, uh, Petra Costal or Petra Costa, and that's the best way. Or, or, or send an email. Can I write somewhere where everyone? Yeah, will, will can you put it in the chat window? Uh, you can select um, everyone uh, in the chat window and then type it in there. Okay, uh, yeah, so you can just send an email to, to this okay. place. All of that. Okay. And I'm going to pass it over to Katarina, who's going to have the last question. For this last question, I mean, it's, it's a big question, so you can sort of take it wherever you'd like to take it. But what I'm interested in is that when I think through your film, I mean, watching it, I thought of so many ways that the things that have happened in the last three years in Brazil resonate with um, 
the last four years in the United States um, and, and more than four years in the United States. And so I think about, you know, how we think about Bolsonaro and Trump and Boris Johnson um, and um, other sort of political leaders who have a kind of right-wing populism uh, that comes with a kind of hate mongering, a sense of sort of a kind of performance of disrupting the status quo that also actually entrenches the power of um, the elite or what you refer to in, in your film as a, the oligarchy in each of these contexts. Um, and But also what's happened in Brazil is distinct to Brazil and pertains to Brazil's um, you know, political history of having had not too long ago a military dictatorship, one that hasn't been thoroughly kind of addressed, right, in historical memory. And so I guess the easier film sort of, uh, the easier question is kind of what makes what's going on in Brazil now under Bolsonaro, um, you know, different from the trend that Bolsonaro is also a part of? Mm -hmm. Can I talk about how it makes it similar? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think there, there's a book that I, I think clarifies a lot out of the confusion of making sense of what has been happening to our, democ our democracies, which is this book called How Democracies Die by Levitsky and Zibula. And they have a list. And it's basically two unwritten norms that are constantly being disrespected, which is uh, which are lack, like mutual respect and 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 self control, <clears throat> and the idea that there's an analysis that the Republican Party has oh, since the 70s uh, incrementally uh, had less mutual respect and self control and is using what they call constitutional hardballing um, to destroy their opponents or delegitimize their opponents because of a sensation that, a sensation, no, a statistical observation that with the growth of the black and Latino population and more women voting and <clears throat> they were losing their vote base and they were going to, um, have less and less perspective of winning uh, elections because they wouldn't have an electoral majority. And I think the same happens in Brazil. When, when one of the sides starts to feel that they're not going to win, that they don't have a perspective of winning in the next four years, then they start abusing of the constitution and finding ways to win undemocratically. And that's what happened in Brazil in 2014 uh, when the PSDB lost the election and did not have a perspective of winning in the next uh, election because Lula could run, so it would be even harder for them. And, that, and, and decided to really disrespect the constitution to be able to reach power. And when you start doing that, when the moderate right starts disrespecting the constitution to reach power, then out of that erosion of democracy, I think you get these Frankensteins, like Bolsonaro, like Trump. And, and of course you add to that having a fifth power, which if you think the fourth power is the media, right? A fifth power, which is social media that is taking over the media, the media and its self-regulation through editors and what not, and has absolutely no regulation and can uh, disseminate fake news and be fed by corporations that will be paying for, for ads. And that, that's what gives us these, these monsters, these two added facts. So, um, and Katarina, is there anything else you wanted to add before we, we sign off? No, I mean, it's, it's a sad point to end with, but I think that's all. Thank you. Uh, Petra, is there anything else you want to, to share with us before we 
we say goodbye? No, I, I mean, there's, there's some, there are beautiful things that can happen and are happening with more young people involved in politics, more women taking over uh, Congress as has happened in the US in the last Congress uh, elections, um, mid, midterm elections, midterm? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that has to continue. I mean, I think we all, all our generation um, was too lazy for too long <laughs> and thought that things were, were fine for too long. And I think we have to take the, the burden of, of resuscitating democracy. Um, at this moment. And I, I think if we concentrate on that, we'll be able to do it, but we really have to give us a lot of our energy. I think that's a lesson that we're learning in the, in the US as well, that it's not enough to, to vote every four years and then go away, that there's work to be done all the time, that, it's, that you have to be vigilant, that democracy exactly. could be eroding you know, when you're, when you're distracted with something else. And so we, we all need to be engaged in doing that work. Exactly. Well, thank you so much to everyone. Thank you to Bia. Thank you to Katerina. Thank you to Petra so much. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, also thank you. Thank you both to you and Bia, Anna. Thank you, Katerina, Anna, Bia, and everyone. And yes, if you can tune into our social media pages um, and send any material you have uh, for the next project. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Have a, have a good evening. Bye. And if anyone's interested, there's this uh, recording should be available uh, on our Facebook page. Uh, it was recorded through Facebook Live. We'll also be editing a Zoom version as well at some point. Um, and, and please come out for our next discussion, um, which is uh, happening on Tuesday for Miss Americana, another Sundance film very, very, very different subject matter. <laughs> and we have one of our faculty members, uh, Kristen Lieb, uh, who's going to be leading that conversation, who wrote a book on gender branding in the modern music industry. So thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Bye.